on the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert, in our hope, and in our waiting, we are never alone. God is with us. So during the course of a month, I usually see her three times. When we see each other, we have just a, a real short amount of time, and she is really busy. And so over the months, I, I just keep trying to build a relationship, get to know her, her family. And when there's opportunity, I share little pieces of my faith. So this month, as we were talking in that brief amount of time, she said to me, hey, uh, our holiday season is busier than most because we celebrate Hanukkah and Christmas. Her husband was raised in a Jewish home. She was raised in a Christian home and even went to a school, a Christian school. I said, wow, that's, that's interesting. I, I said, help, help me understand. And I was asking this genuinely. Um, I said, as Christians, we believe that God sent his son to live perfectly, die sacrificially, and be raised victoriously so we could be saved. So, so for your husband... Like, how, how does he experience salvation from his faith? She hardly paused and began to describe how they were celebrating Hanukkah, candles, gifts given. And then she said, uh, he doesn't really remember what they mean, and I sure don't know what they mean. And our kids kind of sleep through it, but they're excited to get a present. And then she moved on to her faith and kind of talked about how when she takes her kids to their Christian celebration of Christmas, they kind of sleep through that as well. She said, I, I, I don't know what my husband believes. I don't even know what I believe. One of the most profound declarations before Jesus was born is found in Matthew 1, The virgin will conceive. She'll give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel for God is with us. What the heck does that mean? Straight up. Straight up. If, if we're not careful, we find ourselves in a place where we're lighting candles, where we're giving presents, we're setting up the little nativity scene with little baby Jesus in it. We're singing Christmas carols, and our kids are sitting there going, I don't know what any of this means. Do we? Do you? Or is this just what we do? Because it's Advent and we're celebrating the coming of Emmanuel, whatever that means. So this, this month we've, we've been talking about what it means. Like what does it look like for God to show up in the valley of the shadow of death? And we discovered that's where we feel his presence. And then last week Keith helped us with the storm. Like when, when we find ourselves in the storm, we discover God's power. Right there was Jesus in the boat. He spoke and it was over. There was peace. And this week, we get to transition to a, a question of, what's it like to experience God in the wilderness of life? And by wilderness, I mean those seasons in life where you're confused, you're frustrated, you feel dry spiritually. Maybe you're still doing things like singing Christmas carols or praying, but it feels like God is a long, long way away. What does it mean that God is with us? Then we go ahead and tell you, it's in the wilderness that God invites us to hear his voice. All right, so let's take a look. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, go ahead and turn to 1 Kings 19. If you are regular at Cornerstone, you may have noticed, hey, we didn't have a scripture reading. We almost always do. But this time I realized, like, I need to set this story up or you won't feel the weight of the wilderness that Elijah's in. Like, you, you, you'll miss it. So let's kind of build the context. So you go ahead and make your way there. Set your app on, on your lap or right there beside you. Open your Bible. We'll get back to it. First Kings 19. 
But let me set the stage for us, and we're going to have a little fun while I do. All right, so 1 Kings, you begin the story in the midst of the end of King David's reign. So think golden days for Israel. He's dying and handing off the baton. There's a little bit of saga going on, a little bit of an attempt for the throne, but he gets it handed off to Solomon really well. And Solomon takes over. And man, you read the story of Solomon becoming king and it's just inspiring. It's beautiful. God says to Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon says, I feel like a little boy. Please give me wisdom to lead your people. And God gave it to him and he did. But then over time, he strayed. And by the end of it, he had strayed so far taking God's people away from God, that when he died and went to hand the baton to his son, the kingdom split in two. And suddenly we have the north and the south and civil war breaks out, like they're killing each other. Now the northern kingdom, which is where we find the story in 1 Kings 19, is led now by King Ahab. And things have just been going downhill, and the Bible tells us that Ahab is the most evil king the northern kingdom has ever had. You might not recognize his name. You probably recognize his wife's. His, her, his wife's name was Jezebel. Like it just sounds creepy to say her name. If you call somebody a Jezebel, you will get slapped by her. Because that means to call her an evil, seductress woman. I mean, even today, that name floats around. She was something else. The queen of Israel. Israel. To be a city on a hill to be a light in the world, the people of God. Led by an evil man and an evil woman, she had 850 false prophets on her payroll, eating at her table. So the stage is set for a move of God, and he moves in the northern kingdom through a prophet named Elijah. God prompts Elijah to pray that it would stop raining and it dramatically stops raining for three and a half years. During that time, Ahab is on a manhunt to find Elijah because he blames Elijah for their mess. During that time, Elijah keeps doing miracles. He encounters a widow. She and her son are going to starve to death because of the famine, but through Elijah, God blesses her with unending groceries. Her oil and her flour doesn't run out. Then her son dies, and Elijah raises him from the dead. And finally, at the end of three and a half years, Elijah sends a message to Ahab and says, okay, I'm ready to meet you now. They meet, and in chapter 18, Elijah says to King Ahab, like, we're gonna have a battle, kind of a battle of the gods, And we're going to show the people who the real God is. That's what we're going to do. So you get Israel here. Bring all your prophets. You know Jezebel has 450 prophets to Baal on her payroll. Bring them. It's going to be me versus them. We'll find out whose God is the one true God. So they get all the people there, all the prophets there. And Elijah says to the people, it's time. It's time for us to decide who is the real God. Like quit playing around. So here's how we're going to determine who the real God is. I'm going to build an altar. Prophets of Baal are going to build an altar. They can build it however they want. I'll build mine in a way that honors God. But here's the deal. We're going to find out whose God is real by whose God lights the fire. We're talking fire from heaven. And all the people are like, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. So they set it up. Here's here's the story. Okay, guys, uh, you build your altar. Remember, uh, however you want to build it, wood, go ahead and take the ox, lay it on there. Don't light the fire, because that's how we're going to find out. And so just like giving the other team the advantage of winning the, the, the flip of the coin at a college overtime football game, first score wins. Like if Baal lights this fire... Game over. So so go ahead and build it. Get it ready. And then ask Baal to light the fire. Got it? Don't light. Okay, got it. Okay. And. Yeah, go go ahead. Go ahead. (laughs) 
Any luck yet? Hours went by. Hours. Got to be lunchtime. Hey, hey guys, I don't see a fire yet. What's up? Uh, Isn't he he gonna light it? Oh, it's God. I mean, he's way up there. Maybe you need to yell a little louder. Maybe he's um, out on a trip. Maybe he's reliving, relieving himself. Yes, Elijah said, maybe your God has taken a dump. Maybe he's fallen asleep or he's in deep meditation. Y'all need to yell louder. So they did. They were screaming out to Baal. They were even cutting their arms. Blood was flowing in their tradition of getting the God's attention. Went on for hours again. And Elijah said, done. Done. Go sit down, wash up, good grief. My turn. He laid out the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel, put the wood down on top of that. Then they brought the ox, laid it on top of that. And then he said, hey, bring me some water. Like soak this thing. Soak it again. Soak it again. Water was a scarce commodity in a three and a half year famine. He had them put so much water on it that the trench that he had dug around it was full. Everything's wet, 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 wet. And then Elijah called upon God. He said, God, show these people that you are the one true God. God send fire from heaven to consume what I have offered to you. And God did. Fire fell from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, the ox, the wood under the sacrifice, the wet dirt was sucked up by it, the rocks were consumed by fire, and the water was lapped out of the trenches around this sacrifice. And you know how God's people responded? The Lord is God. The the Lord is God. And Elijah said, yes, he is. These 450 false prophets that have been leading us away from the one true God must be executed. And they were killed. And then Elijah prayed that it would rain. It had been three and a half years. Send his servant out. You see any rain coming? No. Seven trips out, seven trips back. The seventh one, the servant said to Elijah, like, I see a little cloud about the size of a man's fist. And Elijah said, it's coming. Turns to King Ahab and said, you better get out of here because it's going to rain. And Ahab left. And Elijah went running after him. About a 20-mile trip down to Jezreel. Now, it's really important you understand this amazing event that just happened on a mountaintop. It was called Mount Carmel. Like this has been one of the most dramatic manifestations of God's presence ever. And so as we move into chapter 19, you and I are going to say, oh yeah, I know how I would react if this had happened to me. But what happens to Elijah will at first confuse you, but then bring hope to you. Here we go. First Kings 19. In verse 1, Ahab goes and tells Jezebel what just happened. Like, hey, this is what happened, and he just had your 450 killed. Verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by the end of this time tomorrow. So what would she say to Elijah? May the gods strike me dead and worse if I don't have you dead by this time tomorrow. Now, if you were Elijah, how would you respond to Jezebel? Like, I'm thinking, now this is going to give away my age. Like, I loved the movie The Matrix. One and two, the third one kind of. But anyway, the first two were awesome. Remember that scene where Neo figures out who he is? Like, the power within him? 
And Mr. Smith shows up. And Neo looks at him and says, he was no longer scared. Like if you've been on the mountaintop with God and some evil woman named Jezebel says, by this time tomorrow I'm going to have you dead. Like I'm thinking he should say, bring it on woman. <laughs> or, or maybe he would have been like my eight-year-old Trine when she gets in one of those little spunky attitudes and she does that head thing. Like I don't even know how she does it. My shoulders move. Like, but somehow she does this like a little attitude thing. Like, I'm thinking Elijah should have done that. Like, bring it, girl. What you got against me? I call fire down from heaven. Do you know who I am? That's not how he reacted. Look at verse 3. Then he, Elijah, was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. I mean, walk through this. Number one, he, he was afraid. So rather than bold, confident, he cowers in fear. Number two, he ran for his life. So it wasn't just something he felt on the inside, but he overcame it on the outside. Like he is running for his life. Number three, he goes to Beersheba. He ran a hundred miles. Like that dude was really scared. Really scared. And where is Beersheba? Judah. Why is that important? Northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Like he ran for the border. The dude ran to Mexico. And then finally, he left his servant there. When you're in a deep, dark place, where do you want to be? Alone. Alone. This is the mess that Elijah is in. He's in a really dark place of wilderness. Confusion, frustration, dryness. But yesterday... He was on the mountaintop. There are some of you today that God has you here, so you'll hear this next line. Here it is. When on the mountain, expect a valley. There's a clear pattern in Scripture. After the Israelites experienced a mountaintop experience, like parting of the Red Sea, Moses getting the Ten Commandments from the mountain, his face glowing, just crazy miracles. Where did they end up? Wilderness. Jesus, right after that mountaintop experience of his baptism where the Father spoke and said, this is my boy, I'm pleased, and the Spirit descended like a dove, where did Jesus end up? Wilderness. Man, when you are coming off a mountaintop of experience with God, expect that a valley is coming. For the Israelites, it happened because of sin. For Jesus, it happened because Satan had a bullseye on his back and he was trying to stop Jesus from fulfilling his ministry. I see it as a pastor all the time. You know, we, we get all excited about the emotions of feeling close to God and then we're vulnerable to other types of emotions and all of a sudden we go from top to bottom. When that happens to you, you are in really good company. Happened to Elijah. The Bible says in James 5, Elijah was a man just like us. God heard his prayers dramatically, and we celebrate that, but he was vulnerable to emotions. And man, he went to a dark place really fast. And it didn't stop there. So he leaves his servant, now on to verse 4. And he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Like he just keeps going deeper, darker, further and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he, he asked that he might die. Saying, it's enough now, Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. <laughs> he was just used by God in such a dramatic way. And now he says, God, just, just kill me. And then he goes on to say, my life is, is useless. Just like my fathers who were the prophets. They spoke and nothing happened. Like Israel didn't come back to God. They just kept going. God, I thought I was going to make a difference. I thought my life was going to count. I thought people were going to listen to me. I thought I was going to save Israel. But it sure didn't happen. Jezebel's going to get me killed. 
So you might as well just kill me. Get it over with. My life is worthless. We don't get a clinical diagnosis here in the Bible. But without question, Elijah is manifesting some of those indicators of real depression. And then we see a beautiful piece of scripture, verses five through eight. When you read five through eight, you find that God then ministers to Elijah in a really special way. Elijah falls asleep. An angel wakes him and says, Elijah, get up and eat. Man, when we are in a place of depression, we don't even want to do just the minimal stuff. Like we don't even want to get out of bed and eat. He falls back asleep again. The angel arrives again and says, Elijah, get up and eat. I mean, it's it's such a beautiful part of the story because some of us have been in that place of saying, you know what? If I screw up, God will be done with me. God only loves me if I perform well enough. And man, he knows how badly I screwed up. So he's just like done with me. He's ashamed of me. He's punishing me. And yet here we have the story of someone used dramatically by God. Did the miraculous things. He slips into depression and God still loves him. God still wants him. God is still inviting Elijah back. And out of these verses, God leads Elijah on a 40-day trip to Mount Sinai. Same place Moses received the Ten Commandments. Now, it's going to be a haul. It's going to take him 40 days to get there. But Elijah then walks to Mount Sinai. And we find in verse 9 that he's lodging in a cave. Like this dude is in spiritual darkness and he's, he's in a cave, like a place of darkness. And in verse 9, we get God's question to Elijah. And God simply says to Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? God is looking for Elijah to confess, to share, to articulate his headspace. Like, where are you at? Where are you at? And in verse 10, we get Elijah's answer. So check this out. Elijah says, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I even, I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Hey, Elijah's in a dark place. He's like, hey, let's talk about me, God. I have jealously sought after you. Like I have lived for you. I have pursued you. I've called other people to live for you. I have jealously just given my life to you. Compare me to the rest of your people. They're schmucks. They've forsaken you. They've, they've, they've destroyed the altars. They've, they've killed prophets. And God, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one. And they're trying to get me dead right now times of wilderness when we're confused and frustrated is always based in unmet expectations. It didn't turn out the way Elijah thought it should. And some of us are there today. Like your life is not where you wanted it to be. Your finances, your relationships, your health is not where you wanted it to be. And you're frustrated with God. And if God were to say to you, hey, what are you doing here? You would have an answer kind of like that. So here's where the story gets interesting, if it's not already. So God says, hey, Elijah, go go, go outside of your cave, dude. And then God began to move dramatically. The Lord passed by, and there was a wind. It was a whopper of a wind. A wind so strong that rocks were shattered. How many of you, both here, Carbondale, like how many of you, we're in southern Illinois during the May 8th storm. Hey, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. We logged 80 mile per hour winds. Man, that thing did destruction in southern Illinois. I don't remember any rocks getting blown into. 
Like this was one whopper of a wind. But the Lord was not in it. And then God sent an earthquake. Man, I was in Haiti just a few weeks after the earthquake down there. And I just remember looking at these buildings just... Wow, the power of an earthquake. But God was not in the quake. And then there was a fire. Fire is powerful. Like I've never been in one of those forest fire kind of things. I've never seen houses get consumed as the fire comes in. Fire is powerful, but God was not in the fire. Now for those of you who are like music lovers, like you really know your music, you're thinking earth, wind, and fire. It must be September, right? Right? Like you're putting the pieces together. So, So God was not in any of those three. And then... There was a still, small voice, a low whisper, thin silence. And Elijah hid his face. And God asked him again, Hey, Elijah, where are you? What are you doing here? And Elijah gives exactly the same answer. I've been faithful to you. Your people are evil and they're trying to kill me and I'm the only one. Get this one in your head. Track with me. Elijah has been used by God to cause it to stop raining, give a woman unlimited groceries, raise her son from the dead, pray again and fire fall from heaven, pray again and it begin to rain. God has used Elijah dramatically. And then... In his dark place, God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? Where are you at? And then God shows him earth, wind, fire, thin silence. And Elijah's depression does not budge. Some of you have been saying, God, if you'll just show up, if you'll just do something dramatic, if you'll just do something amazing, if you'll just use me grandly, I'll snap out of this. Elijah didn't. Elijah didn't. It's in the wilderness that God invites us to hear him speak to us. Look in verse 15 and 16. God says to Elijah, go, number one, anoint Hazael as the new king in Syria. Number two, Anoint Jehu as the new king of Israel. Number three, anoint Elisha as the new prophet to follow you. This is a little bit odd. It's like Hazael would be the king of Syria, their enemy. Jehu would be king, but Ahab and Jezebel are still on the throne. That doesn't make sense. And then Elisha will follow Elijah, but Elijah's confused because God didn't use Elijah to do what Elijah thought God would use him to do. What in the world is God saying to Elijah? Well, in the words of the great theologian, Anna of Arendelle, (laughs) God was saying to Elijah, do the next right thing. My family and I went and watched Frozen 2 a couple weeks ago. And in the midst of a really confusing time, Anna of Arendelle begins to sing that song, Do the Next Right Thing. I just remember listening to her sing and going, wow, that's really, really good. Like that is profound. Many times we get stuck in a place where we're like, okay, I've got to have all the answers. I've got to, I've got to know step five. And even in the song, she's like, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I know the next right thing for me. So check out verse 17 and 18. God God just kind of pulls back the veil for Elijah. And he says, hey, um, I'm going to bring judgment. And whoever Hazael misses as the new king of Syria, Jehu will take care of. And whoever Jehu misses, remember, he's going to be the new king of Israel. That means Ahab and Jezebel's time is ticking. Jehu will take care of him. And if Jehu misses him, I'm going to send Elisha to take care of him. 
I mean, hear God's message to Elijah. He's like, buddy, buddy, I, I got a plan. I got a plan. It's actually bigger than Israel because it includes Syria. That's good news for us because very few of us were raised. Very few of us are by DNA descendants of Abraham. Very few of us. It's really good news that God's plan for salvation goes outside of Israel. They are God's people used to bring the gospel to the world. The gospel is really clear. That through Jesus, every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be represented in heaven. Because God is sending the Messiah. And he will come and he'll be born of a virgin laid in a manger. And then he will live perfectly because we could never pull that off. He will die sacrificially. We have a debt we could never pay off. And then he will be raised from the dead, declaring victory over sin and death so that we can know that we are God's children. We are saved. The plan of God is much bigger than the nation of Israel. Check it out. Syria is on the list. And the plan of God is bigger than the wilderness that Elijah finds himself in because of Ahab and Jezebel. Your time of wilderness is coming to an end. But while you're there, listen. Listen. God speaking to you, revealing the next right thing. And then Elisha. He's like, hey, Elijah. Elisha is coming. And the story is going to go on. Elisha, this, this thing that I'm doing is bigger than you. I shared that a few weeks ago. Like, if we are going to experience fully what God has for us, we got to start thinking past us. We got to think, start thinking beyond our death date. Like, we got to think further than that because God's plan is grander and bigger than my life expectancy. And so, Elijah got a glimpse that he would be followed. It wasn't on him. He was frustrated because of what he had not been able to do. But God saying, Elijah, I'm, I'm still doing a good work even after you are gone. And then in verse 18, God says to Elijah, there are 7,000 people who have not bowed to Baal. Remember Elijah's contention? I, only I. And God says, Elijah, come on, buddy. You're not the only one. And in that, God was giving a promise. Just like Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. God is saying, I have a remnant. And I'm continuing to do a great work. Because people did not respond the way you thought they would or hoped they would, doesn't mean game over. Doesn't mean your life was wasted or futile. Do the next right thing. So here it is. Here it is. When you find yourself in a wilderness, remember, expect that. Especially after the mountaintop. After the mountaintop, expect the wilderness. They come. They are part of life. And when you are in that season, when you are frustrated... Know that it is your opportunity to hear God speak to you. Regularly, regularly I encourage you to read God's word. If you're in a dry place, if you've been frustrated, if you've been confused, spend time in God's word. This would be a great place to start this week. 1 Kings 17, 18, and 19. 17, 18, and 19. 17, 18, and 19. Maybe read those three chapters four or five times this week. See the power of God, the wilderness of a man, and God's grand plan. And when you read the Bible, don't get discouraged when you start. Don't come to that verse that you don't understand and stop and give up. I give you permission to just skip it. Just keep reading. Keep reading. What people find is that when they regularly engage in God's word, it begins to make sense. They hear God speaking to them. They feel the spirit of God leading them. But give yourself some time. Think a chapter. 
four or five times per week. Just, just make sure you're in God's word and it will surprise you over time how much you begin to understand and that your questions become fewer both for the story of God and your story of God as you begin to experience the voice of God speaking to you. And as you hear his voice, you are able to know what is the next right thing. Next right thing. Don't worry about five steps. Don't worry about how this all plays out. Don't even get paralyzed by how is God going to use this wilderness in my life? Don't even worry about it yet. Just do the next right thing. And as time goes by, just like now we have the advantage of looking back and going, oh, that's what God was up to. So will you. So will your kids. So will the church of Jesus. We are invited to see the grandness of the gospel. That God loved us so much that he allowed Elijah to go through a wilderness that he took generation after generation after generation to prepare for a time when Jesus would come, live perfectly, die sacrificially, be raised victoriously so that we could be saved. That's how much God loves you. That's what we get to celebrate this Christmas. Pray with me. Father, we are thankful for an opportunity to see the struggles of a person that you use so mightily because it reminds us of your power and our weakness. God, thank you for pulling back the veil and showing us that pattern of mountaintop to wilderness. Lord, there are some of us who have been in a real struggle this year and as we look back, we realize, oh, like this time of wilderness followed a, a mountaintop. This time of wilderness is going to proceed being used mightily by you. God, show us that. And how we can be encouraged by a person who was used so mightily and yet struggled so deeply. Lord, I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that you spent all of that time preparing to send Jesus so that we could be saved. Lord, may we taste the goodness of your love and grace and the gospel of Jesus again today. Stir us, renew us, save us, O oh God, to your glory. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray.